Okay, we are uh, going to be talking about this topic that's on the screen here about my church family and what that means to each of us. Uh, this is going to be a one-month study. Uh, it'll be everybody, junior high, senior high, and all of adults will be here uh, in the auditorium together. Um, it's possible, and I probably shouldn't mention this because I haven't decided if this is going to work yet or not, but it's possible we may go over to the family room uh, for one or two Wednesday nights, but uh, um, that's just a, a warning that that might happen. Uh, but for the most part, we'll be here in the auditorium. Uh, we mentioned that Joey Treat will be here next Sunday morning, and so he'll be in here at this hour for a report on his mission work. But uh, what I want us to do this morning is to introduce this, this topic of what is the church family? When you think about the church, what is the church? I want you to think about three different aspects of the nature of the church this morning and see, see if we can put these into context. First thing I want us to think about is the church is an institution. What does that mean? What is an institution? That's not asking if you've ever been institutionalized. What is an institution? A what? Something that has been established. What is an institution? If something is an institution, what, what is that? It's an organization. That's the key here. That, that's, that's the key to, this, to, to understanding an institution. Here's the definition. I don't remember if this is Merriam-Webster or who this is. I can't remember where I got it. An institution is an organization that has been established and has been founded for a specific purpose. What kind of institutions do we have today? What kind of institutions do you know about? When I ask questions, feel free to give an answer. All right? Especially, especially the questions where I ask a question and there's a short pause. Now, if I ask a question and I run right over myself, then... Okay then, but if I ask a question and there's any kind of a pause, just jump right in there, okay? If there's a long pause, it's waiting. Wait, okay, all right, gave you time. Now, what kind of institutions do we have today? College. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha, all right. Colleges. Uh, we have uh, institutions of higher learning, right? Uh, mental institutions. Some of us know those well. Some of us know them from the outside. Some of us know them... From the inside, okay. Hospitals, what kind of institutions? Oh, government institutions. We, that, that's what everything is, right? What kind of institutions do we have today? Financial, Financial. banks. Say again? Clubs. Clubs. Clubs, thank you. Couldn't hear you. Prisons. <laughs> Did you just get off of work? Yeah. What does this mean in relationship to the church? What is it, how, how is the church an institution? What does that mean? It's organized. The, the Lord's church is, is, an organ, is to have organization. Is it some haphazard group of people that get together? No, God, God what did Jesus say in Matthew 16 and verse 18? I will do what? Build my church. There is a structure to it. He established his church. It was founded. Does the Lord's church have a purpose? Or is it, are we just random? We just go and do whatever we want. It's an organization that has a structure. I think Chuck said that has leaders, has appointed leaders. Where do we read about all of this information? Where do we read about this institution? This structure. So we have, a, uh, we have a blueprint for this, this, this institution. So that, that's one aspect, if we're to introduce the nature of the church, that's one aspect by which to consider it. Now here's another word, and, and I don't like using this word in relationship to the church, but I think for what we're doing this morning, it fits. The church is a society. What does that mean? What, what, is, what is a society? Whoa, have you been reading the dictionary? 
It's a, no, it's a group of people that have a common interest. That's the definition. Uh, it's a group of people that have common interest and beliefs. It's a voluntary association of people, of individuals, who get together and they all have a common goal. It's what a society is. Society, when, where, the, where the idea of the church being an institution emphasizes its organization... The idea that the church is a society emphasizes that the church is the people. How, how often have we heard this? How often have we said this? That the church is not the building. The church is the people. Sometimes we think the church is the building. I'm going to church as if, as if I wasn't at church before I got there and as if I wasn't uh, as if I wasn't the if I wasn't the church myself and a part of the church myself even before I walked inside of a building. The church, there's an emphasis on the people. So if we talk about the church being like a society, the emphasis is that the group, uh, that the church is a group of individuals who have joined, come together. Do we have a common interest? Do we have one thing in common? You know, there's a lot of people in here. We don't have a lot of things in common. So I was walking up here. I saw Gary and Betsy talking over here. What, a, what, what do Gary Jenkins and Betsy Don... This, this is a dangerous question. What, this is... Be careful. That, remember, we're in church now, so you have to say... not. What do Gary and Betsy have in common? War Eagle. War Eagle. That's what they have in common. All right, now, as I walked up and saw that, I said, okay, how, how many people have that in common? I thought of Johnny Davis. Where'd Johnny go? Uh, I thought of Johnny Davis, uh, um, War Eagle fan. I thought of, uh, uh, who, else is, uh, who else is an Auburn fan? Stephanie Weeks. Stephanie Weeks, that's right, because I saw, I meant to say that, because when I came in, is Stephanie in here? I saw Stephanie's car out there that had the little... Uh, thing on the, where you put the hitch, uh, that AU right there. Uh, Judy Jenkins um, is, uh, is an Auburn fan. Um, we, we've, got, we've got a number of them in here. Uh, where is, uh, is, uh, oh, Miss Matsuo, are you here? Is she, hit, is she in here? You, you, know what her, you know what her email address is? Her email address is Capital A, capital U, some. Awesome with Auburn. That's, that's her email address, just in case you wanted to know. We, what is, what's the point of this? We, how many of you are not Auburn fans? That's the way I was going. That's sad. <laughs> we, have, we don't have a lot of things in common. Okay, uh, and, and, and I chose an out-of-state example because we're not even getting in to talk about in-state examples. All right, there's a lot of things that we don't have in common. Some of you have on the front of your vehicles a house divided <laughs> with a license plate that's got something on it that has Seminoles and Gators on it or whatever. That You've got a divided house, and I'm sorry about that. You know, that, that, that's pitiful. You know, husbands, if, if you can't convince your wives to come over to your side, give up and go to her side, would you? But we have a lot of things where we don't have a lot of common interests. But in the church, do we have anything in common? We have the most important thing in common. I'm sorry, but college football is not the most important thing on this earth. I turned my back to Gary Jenkins when I said that, okay, because I didn't want to see his reaction. Uh, college football is not the most important thing on this earth. Uh, NFL football or whatever else, okay, uh, is not the most important thing on this earth. As Christians in the church, we have the most important thing in common. What is, and so as a group of people, and I hate to use the word society, but as a group of people, we have come together and we have one goal, and that's to get to heaven. Does that make this a special group? Now, to the point. All of that was by way of introduction. 
to get to us, get us to this fundamental principle that's going to be the foundation of this whole study this month. And that is that the church is not just an institution. True. But we're not talking about that this month. Church is a society, group of people. True. But we're not talking about that necessarily this month. Uh, we're talking about the church being a family. Now, let me back up for just a minute. The Bible doesn't use the word institution, that the church is an institution. But does the Bible say that the church is a kingdom? Do, do, does a kingdom have laws? Does a, kingdom, does a kingdom have structure? Does a kingdom have leaders? That's the word that the Bible uses. The Bible doesn't use the word society to describe the word church. But does the Bible use the word a body? Where, where it's a collective body that has common interest? Does your, does your body function as an, with, with a common goal? You know, I, I know part of your body, when the, when the alarm went off this morning, part of your body said, we need to get up, but most of your body said, hit the snooze button, right? So sometimes you do have a divided self, but most of the time your body's working in one direction. Now, what about the family? What is a family? We defined institution, we defined society. Define for me what a family is. Question... Long pause. <laughs> Say again. Okay. They are people that are related. How are they related? By blood. You have been reading the dictionary. This is impressive. Any group of persons that are closely related by, by blood. And they have certain... Uh, convictions, and this is similar to this idea of a society, certain convictions and, and a common affiliation with each other. Is that what a family is? Family, uh, how, does, how does that relate? How does that relate to the church? Are we related by blood? Yeah. Uh, not because we had the same mommy and daddy. We are related by blood. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7 says that in Christ we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. So here we are in this family, and we are a family that has been bought with the same blood. Do we have common interests? At least five times in the New Testament, you'll see these two words right here used together. At least five times in the New Testament, you're going, to tell, you're going to see the Bible telling us we're to be of one mind. Be of one mind. Be of one. What does that mean? What does it mean to be of one mind? You think alike. Is that what you said? One purpose. You try to think the same way. You try to have the same goal. You ha try to have the same purpose. You're going in the same direction. Sorry. Uh, that, that, that there is an agreement. You know what Amos 3 and verse 3 says? How can two walk together unless they be... You all know the rest of that question? How can two walk together unless they be agreed? Can, can you walk with somebody if you're not a, in agreement about where you're going? How can two walk together unless they be agreed? You know, it's an interesting question to consider in Amos 3 and verse 3 when it comes time to deciding who you're going to marry. How can two of you walk together side by side through the, through the, uh, to, through the avenues and the, and the trials of life unless you be agreed? It's a little hard to walk together when you're not always walking in the same direction. What about in the church? Do we need to be of one mind? Do we need to be in, in agreement? Now, how do, you, how do you come to that agreement? We, I just spent a quarter, uh, we've been t uh, teaching the young adults, uh, a young adult married class. And we spent the last two or three weeks talking about negotiation in marriage. Um, how, do you, how do you come to agreement in marriage? Question, long pause, and nobody's willing to step out on that, on that plank. Nobody's at walk in the plank, say, here's how you, how do you find agreement in marriage? Oh, Richard, wise one, share. I agree this is always right. There we go. <laughs> the one man in here who is willing to say that he just agrees that Debbie is always right. 
Um, Debbie, would you like that recorded? Uh, Richard Watson on uh, December the 2nd at 9.21 a.m. Eastern Standard Time said that he agrees that Debbie is always uh, right. Okay, you got it. It's, it's in record. Mickey? Okay. There, there is a... How, how, did, how is there common agreement in anything? When God says in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10... I plead with you that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together, the same mind and the same judgment. How do you get there? This, this is it. This is, this, this is the only way we get there. It is, is that we come back to our common authority, to our common standard that says, here's how we are going to live. Now, the church is a family. Where, where does the Bible tell us that? Get your Bibles out. And, uh, and go, we're going to look at some of these verses that are on the screen. And I'm going to ask or, or at least give some of you an opportunity to read. This is a, a large class with a lot of different people in it. Uh, but we want to try to, uh, uh, try to study this together. Look in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. And uh, I need somebody who will read that verse. 1 Timothy three fifteen. Good, Nate. Thank you for volunteering. Do you have it? It's still coming up. See, some of you are flipping pages and you're already there. But for those of you who are using electronic devices, you're still trying to reach it. Gary is already there. All right, Gary. 1 Timothy 3.15. 1 Timothy 3.15. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Okay. What is, I guess I don't need this mic, do I? Okay. So what is the, what is the church? The house of God. The church is the house. So does that mean the church is the building? What does it mean that the church is the house of God? Well, it doesn't say family. It says house. Does anybody's translation say family in 1 Timothy 3.15? Oh, so now yours says household. Which, which means the family. Somebody else has been reading the dictionary that the household means the family. Now, look at this word house. If you've got the word house or household in 1 Timothy 3.15, go back up to verses 4 and 5 where it talks about the qualifications of elders. And the qualification of an elder in 1 Timothy 3 verses 4 and 5 is that he is to rule his own what? Does it say family? Does anybody have the word family there? Some of you do. Most of you have the word house or the word household. So the husband, the, the, and for an elder to be qualified, he is to be the ruler of his own house or household. Is that talking about the structure? Is he the ruler uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of, the, uh, uh, of the drywall and, and of the uh, insulation and of the nails and the paint? Is that, is that what he's the ruler of? Is he, is he the ruler of the roof and the shingles? And, but that too. That too? Okay. So... It, what is this talking about? Is the, is, it, is the qualification of an elder uh, whether he puts his shingles on right? Is that what this is talking about? This is the family. If he doesn't know how to rule his own family in verse 5, how is he going to take care of the church of God? So when, when the Bible uses the word house here, it's talking about the family. So for 3.15, that, that, that the church is, the church is what? It's the household of God. It's the family of God. We won't take time to, to look at some of these other verses, but uh, the same thing is found in, in, in these other passages. And we'll come back and look at some of these in just a minute in some other, uh, other contexts. So let's, let's get this locked in. The, the premise of our study this quarter is the church is, the church is a family. And, and this family has some, some unique relationships that are a part of it. What kind of relationships are there in a family? Brothers and sisters. Friendships. What kind of relationships are, are there within, within, a, within a typical family? Loving relationships. Respect. Say again. Restrained. Strained relationships. 
in, in, uh, in our homes today, in our families today, are there fathers? Is there a relationship? Uh, are there fathers? In, in the church, in the family where we are today, is there a father? Yes. And he's not a man uh, who wears a cap or uh, who wears a, a collar of some sort. Go to Matthew chapter 23. Look at Matthew chapter 23. Chuck wants to read this. <laughs> Matthew chapter 23, verse 9, Chuck. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father, which is in heaven. Who's that? Call no man on this earth your father. That's talking about in a religious context because that's who, that's who Jesus is addressing or some religious individuals. He says, you don't call anybody on this earth your father. Um, are, there some, are there some people who do call in a religious context individuals on this earth their father? Jesus said, don't do that. Why did Jesus say don't do that? You've got one. You've already got a father and that father is Where? That father is in heaven. Look in, uh, look in uh, Ephesians chapter 4. Look in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 verse, uh, verse 4 says there is one body. Um, even as, uh, um, what is that, Ephesians 4 verse 4. Hey Grant, how you doing? You ready to read? Sure. Read verse 6. Ephesians 4, 6. One God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. How many fathers? How many gods? There's one. There's one God and there's one Father. So in this family that we have, in this family that we have, we've got our Father. Go, go back to chapter 3. Look in Ephesians chapter 3. In verse 14, where it says, we've got our father. And it's interesting what it says in verse 15 about this father. What has he done? We, we, are, we are of this father. And from him, the whole family is named. Where did you get your name? Did you get your name from your father? Um... The family of God, where did it get its name? The whole family of God has been named by the one to whom we belong. So here, here is our, here's our look at relationships. In our relationships in the church, there, there is the Father. Not any person on this earth, there is the Father and He's in heaven. Now, like in some families, there's an older brother. Some of you have or had an older brother. And what a blessing older brothers are to the family. Um, what, 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 would, what would families do without their older brothers? Nobody's willing to even answer that. Uh, what did you say, Scott? Get along. Get along. That, 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 that could happen. In the church, do we have an older brother? We do. Go to the book of Hebrews. Look in the book of Hebrews. We've got an older brother. Look in Hebrews chapter 3. Anybody want to read? Hebrews chapter 3. Up, oh, Vera wants to read. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 6, Vera. Oh, 6. Down in verse 6. Okay. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we? If we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Okay. Whose house, what's the word house? What does that mean? What's another word for house? We saw this. Family. family. We are the family. Whose family we are. Now, who is, who is over this house? It, Hebrews 3 and verse 6. Who's over this house? Christ. What's his relationship according to this verse? He's the son. There's the father. There's the son. 
He's over the family. That's an interesting relationship. Go to chapter 2, verse 17. Who wants to read? Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17. Walking down the center aisle. Alex wants to read. Here, pass this down to Alex. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17. Notice what it says about Jesus. Therefore, therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Aha. He, in order for Jesus to be a sympathetic, merciful, faithful high priest, who chapter 7 says he's always making intercession for us, that verse says he had to be made like who? God could have put any word there. God could have said he had to be made like humans. He, he could have said that. He, he had to, who did he have to be made like? Like his brethren. It's interesting. Go back up earlier in the chapter. Go to chapter 2 and verse 11. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 11. Over on this side, anybody want to read? Hebrews 2 verse 11. Why isn't anybody looking at me? Everybody's looking down like, don't pick me. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 11 and 12, Dan. Read 11 and 12. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. Thank you. Jesus is not ashamed to call those who are in the church his what? His brethren. Have you ever thought about Jesus being your older brother? Perhaps it's drawn out even more in, in Romans chapter 8. Look in Romans chapter 8 and this is a passage that, is, that we'll reference a lot in this particular study. Because it's interesting how God words this over in Romans chapter... Did I say Romans chapter 8? I don't even know where I said to go. Look in Romans chapter 8. Verse 16, the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are who? That we are children of God, okay? So we are children of God. Now, he draws a conclusion in the next verse, says, okay, we are children of God. Now, if we are children, then we are also what? Heirs. heirs. What are heirs? Not, not what kind of shoes do you have? You, you are someone who, who is due an inheritance. As a child, if we are children, then we are heirs. What kind of heirs? We're heirs of God and joint heirs with who? With Christ. Hmm. Is Jesus an heir of God? What, what's Jesus' relationship to God? He's the Son of God. When I'm in the church, when I'm in the family of God, God, God is my Father. I've got Jesus as my elder brother, with whom I become, when I'm in His family, a joint heir. That's a unique relationship, isn't it? You know, you make... You may not have gotten along very well with your older brother. Or maybe you blame it on him and say, he didn't get along very well with you. Um, and this is not the case for all of you, because some of you, you just had scoundrels for older brothers, and they weren't worth a lick for anything. But for some of you, even if you didn't get along very well with your older brother... If there was ever a time when somebody needed to stick up for you, if there was ever a time when somebody came at you or mistreated you, who was one of the first people to jump to your defense? That person you couldn't stand, right? That person who you didn't get along. Sometimes that older brother was the one who would step up and be there. That's an interesting concept to think about Jesus. He's our Savior. He's our Lord. He is our Master. He is our friend. There's all sorts of uh, statements that the Bible uses to describe Jesus. But to think about him as being 
our older brother. So here's our relationships. We've got the father. We've got the older brother. Who are the kids in this family? Us. Where are the kids? We are the children. In God's family, those who are Christians and only those who are Christians are, are in his family. Go to John chapter 8. Look at a couple more passages here. Look in John chapter 8. All right, verse 42. Who wants to read over here? John chapter 8, verse 42. You got it on your little slow phone there yet? All right, John chapter 8, verse 42. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Okay, Jesus says, if who? God were your who? Your father. Verse 44. You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. How many possible families are there? Jesus right here says, if, you're not necessarily, if God were your father, and then he gets over to verse 44 and says, but God isn't your father. Well, who is your father? You're of your father the devil. Go to 1 John chapter 3 real quick. Here's... Uh, in, in this, we have a distinction made in first, uh, is what 1 John chapter 3 and verse 10 says. And again, the Bible points out in this passage that there, is, that there are only two families that are possible. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifested. So in this life, you only have two families, two possible families to be a part of. We're not talking about physical families. Uh, you can be a part of... Um, a number of physical families, can't you? Uh, but uh, talking about the spiritual. And there's only two families possible. But when you're in the family of God, you are, the, you are God's children. And if you're in 1 John, look in chapter 3, verse 1. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that he calls us his what? What could God have called us? He could call us children. What, what other words could God have chosen to use to describe us? Servants? Is that what you said? Subjects. Hmm, that's got a nice ring to it, doesn't it? Say again. Robots? Slaves? That's nice. What, what's a, what, what are some words that God could have used to describe us? Underlings. Yeah, that's, that's a real pick-me-up word, isn't it? <laughs> what manner of love. God, God could have chosen any word to describe us. And guess what? There's a lot of words that describe us a whole lot better than children. Um, what manner of love he has bestowed upon us. You know, it, it's interesting that this verse could say, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that he did not choose to call us underlings. He did not choose to call us subjects. That God calls us his children. Now, when it comes to, when it comes to the children uh, in the family, uh, God wants everyone to be one of his children, but not everybody's going to be a child of God, are they? Only certain ones uh, have been given that right. And we might have to get to this next week. That uh, only certain ones have been given a right to become children of God. And even though there's only certain ones who have been given that right, it's, it's still even fewer who will actually become children. But when I am a child of God, I need to realize how special that is. In my, uh, in my family, there were four children. Two older sisters, one younger sister, and me stuck right in the middle. There were only four kids in our family. It's kind of a small family, but that's an exclusive group, isn't it? 
When, when somebody talked about the Sproul family, guess who they were not talking about? If you were an Ingram, you weren't a Sproul. If you were a Nelson, if you were a Jenkins, it, you weren't a Sproul. When somebody talks about your family, that's an exclusive group, isn't it? Now, I know there's some people who are just dying to be in your family. I, I know there's some people who, you know, they, they just, if they could, they, they'd love to marry into your family just to be a part of it, right? They, they're just, they're, they're sending you emails all the time. You know, is, is, is your son or daughter ready to marry? I'd like to be in your family. Um, there's, uh, when you talk about your family, that's an exclusive group. You talk about the family of God, is that an exclusive group? Now, is it limited? Will, will, the, will only a certain number of people be allowed in? No, but they've got, to, they've got to follow the path that God has laid out. But when God talks about His children, when God talks about His family, does He not draw a line? Draw a line of distinction to say, those who are on this side are a part of the family. What does that say about those who are not on this side of the line? They're not in the family. So here, here's our relationships. We got the father. We got our older brother. We've got who we are to God. Our relationship to God is we are his children. And then our relationship to each other is that we are brothers and sisters. Now, that doesn't mean that we get to fight just because we're called brothers and sisters. Some of us in our families, we, we just thought that's what the word brother meant. That's what we, we thought that's what the word sister meant. You know, we have a special relationship. We get to fight because we're called brothers and sisters. Uh, what, what is this idea of being called brothers and sisters in the church? I find this interesting that in the New Testament, you may not care about this. In the New Testament, the word brethren, brother, brotherly, brothers, brotherhood, those, all of those uh, same root words that 0.3% of all the words in the New Testament, it's one of those. What does that mean? It's a word that's used a lot. Think about all the words in, that, that would, and that's including, you know, all the little words, uh, insignificant pronouns. And yet God chose to use this word a lot. When he chose to describe the relationship between people in the church, what, what, word could, what word could he have used to describe, to explain the relationship between people in the church? Partners. Partners. Members. You're, you're a member of a club. What word could God have used? Think of any others? Associates. Associates. What did he call us? You are brothers... And sisters. Which indicates that there is a special relationship that exists here. That we're, we're, not, we're not employees. We're, we're, we're not co-workers, although we are. We are brothers and sisters. With a special relationship. Does that come with special responsibilities? We're going to spend a, a good deal of time in this month talking about, talking about that point. That there are special responsibilities that we have as brothers and sisters. Now, in this family, who's important? Who's the most important person in this family? Did you have a most important person in your family growing up? Mom. Mom. All right, we'll get it out there. Mom's the most important person. Uh, among your siblings, who is the most important? Now... How many of you are uh, only children? How many of you are only children? You were, the, you were at the same time the most important person and the least important person all wrapped in one. <laughs> Among your siblings, who was the most important one in the family? Who could you not have survived without? Now stop thinking about yourself when I ask these questions and try to branch out a little bit. In this family of God, every Member is important. Are you kidding me? It's time for the second bell. All right. Here's what we're going to do. You've got to be here on Wednesday nights this quarter. 
because this study is just going to go Sunday to Wednesday and it's just all going to flow together. So if you miss, if you only come on Sundays and you don't come on Wednesdays, you're only going to get half and it's not going to make any sense. So be here Sundays and Wednesdays this month as we talk about my church family. And uh, we'll continue this idea of the church being a family next on Wednesday night and uh, get into some responsibilities. Thanks so much for your attention.